Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Alexandra Alvarado. I'm the Director of Marketing and Education at the American Apartment Owners Association. I'm so glad that you could join us today. We're covering a new topic that we haven't talked too much about before, but I know y'all have been asking a lot about passive investing and some of the pros and cons, what are the red flags, and for those of you looking to maybe mix up your portfolio or maybe you have just active investments and you want to switch over to a more passive investing lifestyle, um, there are definitely some things that you need to do to make sure you passive invest intelligently, which is why we have with us Joseph Fang, who's the Director in the Investor Relations at Break of Day Capital. Uh, Break of Day Capital does have a lot of uh, different properties that they are sponsors for. And so Joseph is going to talk to us a little bit about some of the do's and don'ts, red flags, and that kind of thing. Uh, but before we begin, I do want to mention, as usual, we are recording this whole thing. So Joseph told me at the beginning of this to sit back and relax, enjoy the presentation. Um, we will be recording it, providing you with all the PowerPoint slides tomorrow. And don't worry if you do have any follow-up questions for Joseph. We will send you uh, the info tomorrow to get in touch with Joseph or his team. Also, this presentation will go on for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we're going to have questions. So go ahead and put your questions in the question box, preferably not the chat, so that we can keep an eye on those questions a little more easily. Um, definitely, as you think of the questions, put them in, but we will be addressing them at the end of the presentation. Uh, so as I mentioned before, Joseph is the Director of Investor Relations with Break of Day Capital. He'll be giving you a little bit more info about his background. Um, he is in Hawaii right now at a networking conference. I wish I had more conferences in Hawaii, Joseph. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to you to get started. Thanks, Alexandra. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us today, uh, taking um, some time out of your busy schedule. So I definitely appreciate your time. Uh, there's been more and more interest uh, in investing passively in alternative assets. Uh, busy professionals, um, tire landlords, uh, all the things that I can relate to. And so um, this topic, uh, sponsored red flags, uh, is probably one of the most uh, popular items that um, our investors uh, are, are interested in. So I thought that um, uh, we share that with you today. And the hope is that um, by going through these, uh, lear learning about these red flags, you become a savvy investor. So as you um, as you evaluate uh, these private equity uh, passive investments, uh, you become a um, a better evaluator. So a little bit a, a little bit about Break of Day Capital. Um, we are a a, a large multifamily operator uh, with a value add component. Uh, we are focused on um, acquiring underperforming uh, assets, uh, underperforming, underappreciated, undermanaged, and we're particularly focused in the um, Southwest uh, growth markets. And most in, in most in recent years, um, we're really focused in Arizona, where there's lots of high, you know, there's lots of growth, uh, there's lots of um, employers, uh, uh, population in migration, and there's still, you know, still low cost of living. So it's a uh, very attractive, um, business-friendly, investor-friendly, landlord-friendly uh, state to invest in. Uh, what we one of our secret sauces is really focusing on asset management. Um, you may have heard that um, you know there's some operators that are not doing so well right now. You know when interest rates uh, shoot up so much in such a short amount of time, um, it really puts a lot of pressure um, on uh, for operators, big and small, institutional and 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 you know small mom and pop. Um, it really puts a lot of pressure on the operations that, you know, it's, uh, it's like the cost of doing business, you know, uh, goes up uh, tremendously. And so um, uh, by focusing on, on asset management and operations, you know, you can really get through these, these tougher times. Um, so just a, a few things about us. Um, we were recognized by the American Apartment Owners Association, AAOA, uh, as the best real estate syndication company in 2022. Thank you for that. Thank you for the recognition. Uh, we were also recently uh, recognized as the, as the 25th uh, fastest growing real estate company 
on the uh, 2023 Inc. 5000 list. Uh, currently, uh, we have selectively acquired um, over 1,300 units with a total value of $250 million uh, in just the past four years. Uh, we actually have one active deal on the contract right now uh, in Tucson, Arizona, which we could uh, talk a little bit about later. Uh, we have um, in our uh, current portfolio right now, seven multifamily units, uh, seven multifamily properties with uh, totaling 972 units, about $182 million uh, assets under management. Uh, we have sold uh, uh, three of those um, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, and hence the uh, the numbers a little smaller right now. Um, but uh, we exceeded uh, those investor projected returns significantly, and we can also get into that a little bit later. So this is our our mission statement. Um, it's not just about making money; it's about um, providing our passive investors with a superior risk adjusted returns, and also providing quality communities for our residents to live in. Uh, this is a win-win scenario that we really are uh, proud to be part of. And uh, just a little bit of our core values. Um, as fiduciaries entrusted with managing people's money, precious capital, um, we, we believe that these are the values that are really critical in this business. Um, integrity, transparency, diligence, and communication should not be a surprise to anybody. Um, the one thing that we get a lot of questions on is what is Kaizen, right? It, this is actually a word um, that's um, uh, very deeply entrenched in the Toyota culture. Um, it's this idea of constantly making improvements, no matter how small, because a lot of small improvements will, will, will stack over time to, to, make, uh, to, to turn into a, a giant improvement or, or it, it can really move the needle over time. And this is what we believe in. Every, everything that we do from our employees to the way we do things, managing our property managers, acquiring deals, working with our lenders, everything that we do, we're always looking for ways to improve. So a little bit about Gary Lipsky. He's the CEO and founder of Break of Day Capital. Uh, I, I apologize for him that he couldn't join us today. He's actually at a conference somewhere um, doing some public speaking. Um, he's uh, always traveling and, and giving um, talks on multifamily. Um, but he's been a real estate investor uh, for a really long time. And um, more importantly, um, he's also been an entrepreneur uh, for over 30 years. So he's an operational expert, uh, really focused on uh, management and operational expertise. Uh, he wrote the Amazon bestselling book. Uh, it's called Best in Class. And it's really um, focused on asset management. And later on, we can talk a little bit about what's the difference between asset management uh, versus property management. Um, asset management is more um, a, a more of a higher level view. It's more like project management where you're uh, where you're coming up with the business plan and, and tweaking the process along the way. Whereas the property management kind of deals with the property on a day to day basis. Uh, so uh, he he's also the co founder of the Asset Management Summit. Um, they did a, a conference, a, a virtual conference. A couple of years back, I had, had uh, over 1,800 uh, attendees. Uh, he, prior to focusing on uh, Break of Day Capital full time, uh, he was the founder and co president of a company called ARC, which specialized in providing after school programs um, uh, for, for students. And um, this was a very large uh, organization with over 700 employees. And he ran that business for many, many years, uh, including going through the great financial crisis, which is a which was a pretty difficult uh, time to um, uh, navigate through. Uh, he's also the the founding board board member of uh, a nonprofit um, uh, uh, called Core Education. Uh, the rest of the uh, investment committee is comprised of myself and Eric. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Um, my professional background um, is in asset management, so typical Wall Street. Uh, I spent over a decade uh, with a hedge fund in New York City, and then uh, seven more years with a large global fund manager in Los Angeles. Uh, my wife and I have also been investing in real estate um, as an active uh, owner and operator of residential real estate in Southern California, over 20 units uh, for 20 plus years. And uh, I would say that the in the last uh, seven years, um, 
we started to scale our real estate portfolio um, through these uh, by investing passively in real estate syndications uh, with different operators uh, in different asset classes, all up and down the capital stack, uh, really just um, as a way to, uh, you know, uh, I'll admit that, you know, we become tire landlords and um, it's very difficult, uh, you know, to be an operator, to be a, a real, real estate investor in Southern California. And so um, we have um, uh, invested in, uh, at this point, uh, 63 of these syndication deals. So uh, we certainly um, have had good experience, you know, uh, learning who the good operators and the bad operators are. Uh, to my right um, on the screen here is Eric. Uh, he's our acquisitions and asset manager. So his day-to-day -day role is really um, deal sourcing. He, he, um, he has intimate relationships with a variety of brokers. Uh, he's always evaluating uh, potential deals for us. Uh, underwrites a lot of deals. We put them through through, through our funnel, and then basically, um, you know, we probably look at a hundred deals and maybe ultimately buy one. Um, he's also our asset manager, so he deals. Um, uh, he he works with our property management companies um, on on a very intimate basis, and he's always uh, making sure that they're executing our business plan and uh, you know within budget and and on time. Uh, his pro his professional background is um he's had various roles um you know in uh, in, in in acquisitions and asset management brokerage uh, credit and development and his most recent stint uh, was with a publicly traded REIT uh, specializing in medical offices but he recognized that the uh, uh, large multifamily uh, workforce housing is really re re uh, re really where where you want to be over the next 10, 20 years uh, you you guys probably all heard that there's a tremendous amount of uh, a shortage of housing, especially um, uh, affordable housing. And, and that's why we um, really love what we do. So uh, a little bit about the markets that we operate in. Um, so again, um, we currently have seven properties in our portfolio. We've had three full, full cycle exits in Arizona that far exceeded our projections. And just I'll just throw the numbers in there real quick. Um, we underwrite to a 15% IRR, which is roughly... Um, about a 20% average annualized returns uh, over a five-year holding period. Um, so we exceeded, we exceeded that significantly. Um, uh, we, we actually produced a 61% RRR on average over the, the exits. Now, I know that that's only a few um, data points. Um, we haven't been around for 30 years, but um, you know, th those are just the, uh, the, the numbers that we've been able to achieve. Uh, we do that um, because we have culminated um, really good, strong relationships with the local brokers and lenders, uh, you know, over the years. And, and we do that by doing what we say we're going to do. Right. Um, this is a, you might know that the large multifamily space is very, um, it's very clicky, you know, and uh, brokers um, only award deals to their best buyers. And we, you know, when we say we're going to buy something, you know, we have to execute and that's how we win really good deals over time. Okay. Uh, and, and just uh, to finish up, um, as I said, we really like the Southwest growth markets. So that's everywhere from uh, New Mexico to Arizona to to uh, Utah, Nevada, Colorado. Um, uh, so, uh, but the over the last few years, the the best deals have been in Arizona, and we continue to love the Arizona markets. Okay, so now let's get into um, um, the, the the gist of this presentation sponsor red flags okay so as you get into the private equity real estate syndication uh, opportunities you want to um figure out you know who you should be investing with and what kind of deals you should be investing in and um you might have heard the um there's a there's an old adage that you should bet on the jockey and less about the horse right because no matter what um no matter the deal it's the, the the team that is operating the deal is the most important is the most critical because you know i'm going to quote gary here for a second um he says that a good sponsor can make a mediocre deal great or i'm i should say a mediocre a mediocre deal good and a good deal great and then i also added to his um comment that a bad sponsor could run a great deal into the ground and having uh, uh, putting on my lp hat on um, having invested in close to 63 deals at this point, um, I have personally experienced, you know, what it's like to invest with good and bad sponsors. And, and that statement could not be further from the truth. 
Okay, so uh, red flag number one. This is probably the most critical. Lack of track record, okay? So um, just like, you know, when if you're dealing with some medical issues and, and you want to have... Um, you know, you want to, you, you need a procedure done. You, you go to a specialist with lots of training, right? You like, you're not letting somebody, you're not letting a medical student like practice on you. Right. So it's the same thing, you know, in the real estate, you know, investing world. Um, You want to make sure that, you know, the, the sponsor team has significant track record that they're not practicing with your money. And so you look at their history and you're looking for a consistency of results. And then um, one caveat there, um, this is a uh, private equity has become um, more and more spoken about in so on social media. And so there's a lot of great podcasters, lot, lots of um, bloggers and, and YouTubers out there talking about how great private equity real estate syndications are. But be aware that many of them are actually just capital raisers. Um, they're co-GPs. They're not really the operators. They're not really the people that are boots on the ground, the people who are in there in the trenches, doing the dirty work like that's what we do and so so make make sure you you distinguish the difference between an operator and a syndicator or a capital raiser they're not you know they're not the same okay all right so here's some questions that you can ask uh, as it relates to track record how many deals have they owned and operated not just invested in other people's deals it's, there's a kind of a little shady thing that some sponsors do uh, or, or they claim is oh, having 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 units of track record, but really they they were just passive investors in other people's deals. But so you really want to make that distinguish, uh, make sure that you distinguish between the deals that they're, that they're running, that they're the lead sponsors on versus the deal that they have invested with other people. So what, what does that mean? Like what, what's considered significant track record, right? So that definition is going to be a little bit different for everybody, but I would say Maybe something like this, you know, maybe at least $100 million AUM. Maybe they've done 10 deals. They have over 1,000 units and maybe five full cycle exits, you know, some something like that, you know, uh, just as a, as a, as a starting point. Uh, you want to um, pay attention to see if they have any market cycle experience, right? I mean, we all know that, you know, there's cycles, there's market cycles, there's, there's, uh, there's debt cycles, there's real estate cycles. There's all these, you know, everything moves up and down. And so it's really favorable if you see that they have experience going through the great financial crisis. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a multifamily. You know, it could be in real estate. Um, it could be running a large business because running a large, um, a, a large multifamily portfolio is similar to running a large business. So, you know, you have to manage payroll. You have to manage your, your book. You have to manage your P&L. You're managing revenues, expenses, and ultimately, you know, you you know the profitability of the business, right? So there's a lot of similarities there. Um, you want to ask. Don't be afraid to ask tough questions. Ask them, you know, what issues they've 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 dealt with, uh, how how do they overcome them, and and what lessons you know have they learned? Nobody's perfect, you know. Um, we've been real estate investors for a long time, and you know we're we're learning new stuff every week. Um, so so um, ask them, ask them um what um you know, what, what some of the tough uh, experiences have been and, and how they, how do they deal with it? Um, and then following up, following up with uh, the tough questions, ask them if they've lost property, uh, if they've ever lost investor money, um, have they, you know, issued capital calls? This is, um, if you're not familiar with that term, this is kind of a, a hot topic right now. Um, what happened, uh, what happens is that um, when an operator uh, faces a cash crunch, for example, um, not being able to um, backstop uh, this this rapid rising uh, of interest rates and having a very large debt servicing uh, burden that that is eating up into the cash flow uh, that is eating up into the rental income to the extent that the property is now uh, experiencing a, a loss and so they're having to go out to their investors and asking for an injection of capital. Um, you know this is highly unfavorable. Um, this puts the investor under a lot of duress. And so um, this is something that is really frowned on. And But unfortunately, it's happening to the bad, bad operators today. Um, ask if they have ever tossed distributions um, or, um, or or just simply if, if, if they've been performing or have performed below expectations. Um, ask if they ever declare bankruptcy. 
if they've ever been cited for uh, cited by the SEC or FINRA uh, for any type of violations, or ask them if they have, you know, if they ever have bad credit, you know, um, and you know, the operators that um, are transparent and want to earn your business, uh, want to build that relationship uh, with you, will be more than forthcoming, and uh, they will be happy to share share these with you. Um, also, um, ask for references, you know, ask for uh, references from existing, uh, previous, uh, uh, repeating investors. Um, you can even ask for um, uh, prof professional references, ask uh, to speak with their lawyers, ask to speak with their CPAs, with their cost segregation engineers, uh, ask to speak with their transaction attorneys. Um, you know, just uh, by way of example, we recently um, put together an investor dinner and we had about 75 people show up and um, we had our whole team there. We had our syndication attorney, uh, I should I should say a real uh, real estate transaction attorney. We had our CPA. We had our, our lenders. You know, so our investors can ask them. You know, how how does Break of Day Capital you know do business? You know, are we do we say what we do? Like, are we are we easy to work with? Are we professionals? You know, um, to to be transparent, um, um, it, you know, is is a, is not not only is it a good thing, it's critical. Uh, another red flag is lack of market expertise, right? Um, as a as an astute real estate investor, um, we believe that you really need to know your market extremely well. You need to know it. You need to know the different demographic trends. You need to know um, all the idiosyncrasies of a particular sub-market. And um, I mean, you need to know it street by street. I mean, you know, as a long-time uh, real estate investor, you know sometimes even just a, a two block difference can uh can make a huge you know it could be could, could be something very different right and so when you see a sponsor that is in a bunch of different markets like you know oh yeah we're in the sunbelt states right like uh you know we're we're we're, we're everything from the southwest to the southeast to texas to to the you know to uh to the carolinas you know it's just you cannot you you cannot possibly focus you you couldn't have the manpower to be to be experts in, in those markets. So you really want a, a, an operator, you know, who who really really understands the markets that they operate in. I mean, look at us. You know, we we tell people that we really like the Southwest, but all of our deals have been in Arizona. I mean, we study the markets really well, but you know, Arizona is where we're very comfortable in. So here are some questions that you can ask them. Um, you know, how many markets are they in? And we don't like sponsors that have more than two, three markets, to be honest. Um, and, and ask them um, if, if they if they are the boots on the ground, you know, or are they just simply capital raiser? Are they just co-sponsors? You know, um, th those things are important. Okay, here's a, a kind of same, but uh, slightly different, but related to the, the previous um, red flag, which is product type expertise. Right. So, for example, break of day capital, we only focus on multifamily. Uh, in fact, we're very focused on a segment of the multifamily, which is the which is uh, uh, commonly referred to as the class B and C workforce housing. You know, these are outdated properties that have some kind of um, improvement component where, you know, we can um, add value. Right. So there's operators out there that will do multifamily, office, self-storage, you know, retail, industrial, basically chasing the latest, you know, whatever the latest trend is or whatever the hot topic is, you know, on social media, right? And they're all different, right? Uh, when, when you're doing office, it's like, you know, the, the, the tenants tend to be corporate in nature and they tend to have 10, 15, 20 year leases. So you can't really adjust um, that much. You, you can't really adjust the rents that much um, and then also, you know, you, you guys all know what's going on with the with the with the market right now. Um, people are more and more people are you know going to uh, or more and more of us are working from home. Um, I'm I'm working from Hawaii, so that's. <laughs> um, but um, more and more people are working from home, and so there's less of a a, a demand, a lot less demand for office, right? So you know you're seeing office at fifty percent occupancy, and and doesn't seem like there's any any um resolution in sight to how that's going to play out but on the other hand you know workforce housing affordable housing you know we're like we're at 95 percent occupancy you know so it's the dynamics are very different and so as an operator 
it's very difficult, you know, to really be a, an expert in all these different um, product types because they all have their you know uh, idiosyncratic um, uh, dynamics. So again, um, just as a tip, you know, uh, maybe focus on operators that are just in one or two product types, um, and then be aware of um, operators that are due to lack of deal flow. Um, they're raising capital for other asset classes like ATM machines or or car washes or or RV parks in which they're not experts in, and um, it, it's just you know. It's because there's no deal flow in, in their in their product specialty, and and so therefore they're they're, they're raising they're they're making they're raising capital and, and making acquisition fees or or capital raising fees by raising for other people that they're not really experts in. So to to me that's it's a bit you know it's kind of a red flag. Okay, here's another one: full cycle experience, right? So it's one thing to buy the deal, uh, to operate the deal, but ultimately where the rubber meets the road is to exit the deal, right? Like uh, how, you know, you, you have to be able to ultimately, you know, deliver, you, you ultimately have to make money for your investors. And so you'll want to see how many successful exits the, the sponsor team has, you know, has experienced. And then um, to get down to a more granular level, you also kind of want to see um, how, how those returns were generated. Um, did they come from market appreciation or did they come from, something that the operator did uh you know in executing their business plan being able to raise re uh, rents being able to increase efficiencies and reduce expenses ultimately increasing net operating income because as you guys know um these commercial residential properties are value based on a stream of income right it's based it's value on a stream of it's it's value on the net operating income and so to the extent that you you can increase the net operating income by by doing something, um, by performing your business plan, by doing some sort of value add, um, you're able to force that appreciation. You're able to increase the property value regardless of what the market is doing. Okay, so here are some uh, some examples of questions that you could ask. You know, how many deals have they gone full cycle? What were the results? Did they exceed expectations? Um, and then again. Um, what was it due to uh, net operating income growth or was it due to cap rate compression, which is, you know, as the Fed, you know, prints money or artificially depresses interest rates, it causes the cap rates, the valuation of uh, assets to, you know, become more rich, right? So did the returns come from that, you know, which is kind of out of our control or did it come from something that we actually did, right? So when you ask these questions, a good operator should be able to show you how the returns came. Um, so just kind of, you know, going back to um, um, our track record, you know, earlier I mentioned that um, out of the three deals that we exited, um, we produce a 61% net IR return to our investors, which is like incredible, right? Um, if you were to strip out the market component, it would probably be more like in the 30s. So again, we underwrite to a 15% IRR, but we probably would have been able to generate a 30%-ish IRR, excluding um, the, the, uh, the, the, the help from the market. Hopefully, um, I make myself clear with that. And so, yeah, ultimately, um, what, you're, what you're paying the GPs, what you're paying the sponsor team uh, to, to do, to perform is generating that value right in 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 a investment speak it's called alpha right beta is the market appreciation or lack of appreciation alpha is something that the operator did to increase the value um, of that property okay um and also um we're kind of getting into the weeds here um but the, another, another red flag is the lack of uh, uh, strategy experience, right? So there's a difference between executing on a value add where you're taking older properties and then making them and, and you're improving and, and modernizing and, and making them more contemporary, right? Versus like a ground up development versus like buying a class A luxury property that is already stabilized, that doesn't require um, any kind of lift, right? You're basically just buying it for cash flow, right? 
those all require different um, um, expert or maybe they require different operational expertise. And just because someone's really good at value add doesn't mean that they're good at ground up. So be careful that um, when you're evaluating one's track record, make sure that they're doing the same type of stuff they've done before. Okay, so here's the couple of questions um, uh, you can ask about that, right? So, you know, if you look at their track record, it's all value add multifamily, but all of a sudden they're doing the ground up, you know, that that is a red flag or, you know, definitely um, be prepared to ask a lot of questions. Okay, uh, here's one that is really important. I think it's super critical. Lack of skin in the game, right? Um, there needs to be alignment, alignment of interest and um, uh, uh, skin in the game uh, between the sponsorship team and and the uh, the the passive investors, um, and um, you want to see that um, the operator has their own capital at risk, you know, and um, you know it's it's really important because you you want to see that the operator would be more hurt. Um, if the deal goes south, then the the passive investor and therefore they're incentivized to do everything they can to not only protect the deal, but to, you know, potentially um, exceed, you know, to, to do something extra to to uh, to exceed a uh, uh, projection. Right. And so you want to see that um, they're putting their own money in the deal. And um, and uh, uh, here's a little bit of a nuance. Most operators will take an acquisition fee. Um, you want to see that the money that they're putting in, uh, their own money that's in the deal, exceeds, far exceeds what they're collecting in fees. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Um, so I kind of mentioned that um, uh, in the previous slide. Um, you, you just want to see that there's plenty of skin in the game. Um, again, just... Um, uh, making sure that the, there is an alignment of interest that the sponsors are incentivized to really uh, try to exceed projections, but also will be more hurt than you are uh, as as the operator. Um, something um, that's kind of um, been going on for a while that people haven't people are starting to notice is that um, and this is I'm just really talking specifically about value add deals where. Um, the first year or two, you're not seeing a ton of cash flow because as you renovate units and then getting the rent bumps, um, there is a, a, a lag between, you know, there's a lag to stabilization, right? And therefore, you, the operator should not be underwriting significant cash flow as there's a lot of turnover in the first year. Um, there are operator, there are sponsors out there that basically promise investors return, returns, uh, distributions like within a month after the property closes and sometimes they're paying a very high cash flow whether it's mid single digits or very close to the preferred rate um those are red flags because what's really happening there is that they're not actually paying you distributions out of the comp out of the uh, rental income they're paying you distributions out of the capital raise so they're basically just paying you back with your own money right so not only is not so not only is that not considered cash on cash return, it's nothing more than a return of capital, right? And so not only is it illegal to categorize that as a as a cash on cash return, um, it's it's just it's highly unethical and and this is the kind of stuff that would potentially lead to, lead to a Ponzi scheme. And the way that you can know that is if you look at the if you review the financials, and you see how much net cash flow there is so so when you look at the um the the financials you'll see that there's net operating income and then there's the debt servicing cost um section at the very bottom there's basically free cash flow if you look at that amount and then if that amount is less than what they're paying out in distributions then you know that they're paying out of reserves or they're paying out of the capital raise which to me is a huge red flag Okay, here's a, another one that's kind of related to having skin in the game. Um, you want to see that the sponsorship, uh, the sponsorship team is actually signing on the loan, that they're not just you know hiring other a uh, bunch of other people to um, qualify for the loan on their behalf. Again, this is consistent with having skin in the game. 
even though a lot of the loan, um, a lot of the loans are not are are non recourse. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it is a it it is a, a detriment to the sponsor. You know, if something goes south. You know, if they lose a the property to the bank, right? You you have a, a, a you know, if you lose a property, um, you you're probably un, it's probably a highly it's probably highly uh unlikely that you'll ever do another deal again, right? So, um, this is important. Okay, so you know ways to 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 um. <laughs> I had somebody ask me on one of these uh, sponsor red flag um webinars. How do you know? You know, <laughs> just ask. <laughs> just just ask them to show you the loan docs that they're actually signing on the loan, right? And you could ask if there's any co GPs or any um key principals signing on the loan as well. And, th and that's not a problem, you know. Um, you know the, these these uh, loans are you know usually you know multiple millions. Uh, you know, this this latest deal that we're um we're buying, I think it's a. Uh, 22 or 23 million dollar loan so you know um we we do need some help for our from our co co gps and, and and kps to help qualify for the loan but we are certainly signing on the loan ourselves you know to making making sure that there's plenty of skin in the game oh this is um lack of a continuity plan this um this topic doesn't come up um uh, enough and i kind of want to just uh, uh, put this out there uh when you um one of the questions you should ask the sponsor team is um, what would happen if the lead sponsor or if, um, you know, a, a key person on the team becomes incapacitated, right? And, um, you know, you, know, you, you want to know that there's a continuity plan, like what, what's going to happen? And so, you know, these are the questions that you can ask, you know, can, is a team, is the, is the rest of the team member, you know, the rest of the team members, like, are they strong enough to, take over the operations and then have an orderly wind down of the portfolio. Um, are there, um, is there another GP uh, that's in the deal or, or that, that can run the portfolio or maybe somebody else that they can appoint um, in case that there's an issue. So bottom line is that, you know, you just want to see that there's a continuity plan. Okay. All right. This is a really, 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 really big deal. And I, I'm kind of saving this towards the end Um uh, saving the best uh, best for last um lack of communication um you know um when you're entrusted with managing people's money um you have to make sure that investors feel comfortable that not only do you not know what you're do do you do you like know what you're doing but that you know you're always communicating with them the good the bad and the ugly transparency and honesty and being forthcoming and doing that in a timely, consistent fashion is absolutely critical. Um, I think many people on this call are probably very experienced real estate investors, and you know that you know uh, things are never just perfectly, you know, always great, right? It's not always rainbows and unicorns. I mean, we get put through a lot, right? You know, we we have to deal with a lot of issues. I mean. During COVID, um, our own deals that we 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 manage in, in California, um, there were three tenants out of fourteen that um, did not pay rent for two years. Right, so you know how how am I going to be able to take a you know take a distribution? Right, I have to keep all the money in the bank account doing uh, to make sure that we can meet our loan obligations. Right, so um, there's things that happen out of our control. And, but we just have to be forthcoming. We have to tell our investors, um, you know, what's happening and, and to do it uh, well in advance, not, not tell people a year later, but to tell them well in advance, what, you know, what issues are we having to deal with and, and what are we going to do about it? Right. There's always something that can be done. Okay. Um, the worst thing is probably to just sit on your hands and pretend nothing's wrong. And, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot, uh, there's a lot of bad operators out, out there just don't understand how critical communication is. You know, they wait until things um, about to blow up. I mean, I, you know, you, you guys might have heard the story in um, in Houston, um, the, the guy that blew up a, a 3,200 unit portfolio, like like his investors were, were finding out that that um, he was getting, um, that, um, you know, he was going to lose the property from other, you know, from, from like, I think from other investors or from the lender that he was trying to buy another deal from. It, it's just insane, you know? Um, and just as a contrast, you know, by way of example, um, during COVID, uh, break of day capital actually increased um, the cadence of our communication. We actually went 
uh, went to two times a week, letting our investors know what the collections of rents look like. Uh, if if we're having any uh, um, um, delinquencies, you know, any, any trouble with uh, collecting payments and getting relief payments from um, from the state, so we kept our investors uh, very well informed. And then uh, just uh, uh, another thing that we do is um, we uh, we do a monthly communication, and the the communication on the assets go out on the nineteenth of each month, and it has and there's a paragraph. Letting people, letting investors know what's going on in the property, um, and then followed by a section of financials, important KPIs like rent, rent, uh, rent, rent increases, rent, rents collected, uh, expenses, other income, net operating income, uh, collections, delinquencies, all that stuff, um, actual versus projections, so that you can evaluate on how we're doing on a monthly basis. And then if there's the, and then there's things that are not going as well, what are we doing about it? And then you can see the improvements over time, right? So so those, you know, that that is really 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 critical. In fact, um, I will tell you that there's been some operators that I've invested with that have done a pretty good job, but their communication was terrible. And so and for that alone, I would never invest with them again. Why? Because I don't know what they're doing with my money. You know, I I just know that it. Ultimately, it went okay, but I would rather know what's going on every step of the way. And by the way, that's also one way to prevent or to mitigate the potential for Ponzi scheme, right? When things are too consistent, when they're too good, when they're just too perfect, it's just, you know, we all know as real estate investors that that's highly unlikely, right? Things are going to go wrong. It's just a matter of like how you deal with it is really the key. And so, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, you can ask for sample um, communications or, or email communications that um, operators send out to their to their investors. You can kind of gauge the quality and the, the frequency of, of the communication. And then um, here's another thing, um, you know, as you evaluate sponsors and and you you talk with them, um, look and see and and just gauge and and how quickly how, how quickly they respond. And the quality of their response, right? Because they don't have your money yet, um, and if they're already not communicating with you well, can you imagine what happens after they have your money and you know no, your money's already now now you're stuck and married to them for the next three to five years? Like they no longer have an incentive, you know, to to like communicate well. So try to catch that in advance. Um, just a a, a brief um. Uh, mention of why consider investing passively. Um, really three big things. And I, I kind of mentioned that um, uh, earlier. Um, you have economies of scale, right? Um, it's very hard to buy these large multifamily assets. You know, they they typically run in the 20 to $40 million range. I mean, even if you can buy one or two yourself, um, you'll soon run out of capital to do more, right? And so why not have a piece a small piece of multiple properties so that you're diversified and you get to enjoy all the benefits, you know, uh, uh, of, of um, multiple uh, multifamily properties that you know that they have larger uh, scale of economy, right? There's, there's higher potential appreciation, uh, income, cash flow, And then, um, um, yeah, so that's, that's one of the benefits instead of just doing, you know, continue to do like, duplexes and quadplexes, right? Um, you're also leveraging the team. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, I really like focus operators who are really good at their particular asset class, uh, also the markets that they specialize in. So you can leverage that. You cannot be an expert in every market and every asset class. So why not invest with the team who's really good at what they do? And finally, this is really awesome, right? I, um, I don't know how many guys ever been sued. I've been sued before a few times. It is not fun, right? The stress that goes with that. Well, as a limited partner, as, an, as a passive investor, the worst thing that can happen is that you lose your capital, right? They can't come after you for more than what you put in, right? So the limited liability aspect of passive investing is also very attractive. Um. 
we currently have an active deal right now. Um, it's actually, we have actually uh, placed it in a fund. Uh, and just to kind of highlight uh, what 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 this deal might look like, um, you um, there's diff there's basically three different investment classes uh, A, B, and C. Uh, a is a preferred uh, equity uh, investment class. Um, that one pays a ten percent preferred return, and it's paid on the monthly, uh, but you do not get any additional upside. Uh, you also do not get uh, the the uh, depreciation benefits um, in, in, uh, that you would get in the other two classes, okay? Uh, the benefit of preferred equity is that you sit, um, uh, you sit, um, well, it's really, you sit in the lower part of the capital stack, meaning that you're, you have priority to the uh, cash flow as well as the return of capital. So it's safer. Um, class B and C, our common equity. And um, this is what most of us invest in. And that has a preferred rate of return and then followed by a waterfall. And uh, you also get the bonus depreciation or the, I should say the, uh, we, we do a cost segregation. So for those, for those of us that are real estate professionals, uh, you can use the uh, bonus depreciation to defeat um, uh, your, your, your capital gains. In fact, um, um, this is probably a good reminder for anybody um, who um, has exited or who is exiting deals in 2023, um, by investing uh, in the class B or C uh, class, we're going to be able to give you roughly between 72 to 75% of your capital as depreciation. So that will really help out um, if you have any deals that you're exiting. Now, even if you're not a real estate professional, if you're a W-2 uh, employee, as long as you have, you know, uh, these passive income, um, whether it's from a, a, if you're in, if you're exiting from another syndication or if you're exiting um, out of real estate, um, you can you can use the bonus depreciation as well um, as a non uh, res, uh, real estate professional. Um, so going back to the uh, the the class B and C uh, common equity, um, the way you should think about this is that. Again, going um, in um, with the uh, uh, with, with the uh, the value of or with the uh, focus on um, alignment of interest, you will get back your money first, and then you will get your preferred rate of return, which is um, the amount that it has prior that the investors have priority over, and that amount has to be paid to you first uh, before the sponsor team before the GPs uh, participate in the profit sharing. Okay. So in the class B, you should expect to receive somewhere between 15 to 20 percent IRR um, net of all fees, and that will be uh, distributed on a quarterly basis. And then the class C um, is actually uh, something that we created for our family offices and for small institutions, other private equity funds that have uh, large minimums um, for a million dollars or more. Uh, we're able to give you a better waterfall, better profit split. And that's usually about a two to 300 basis point improvement over class B, okay? So just the, for, for those of you um, that want to write a large check, you know, we can certainly give you more of the profits. Um, and then also, uh, I, it's not not mentioned uh, or not uh, on, the, on the screen here. Um, we can also uh, 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 accommodate uh, those, those people that need to do a 1031 exchange. Um, those will be good for people who need to exchange $500,000 or more and we can um, we can talk about that offline, but um, we can bring you in as a tick partner, okay? Um, so the fund would have a projection that looks kind of like this uh, here on the screen. Uh, on a hundred thousand uh, dollar investment, yeah, you, know, you should expect the cash flow distribution to look like uh, look like the following, um, you know, over the next uh, five years. Um, you can see how the cash on cash return is kind of in the low single digits. Uh, recall that I mentioned earlier that um, as we go through the renovation, as we execute the business plan, there will be some turnover, right? So we are going to bring occupancy rate down a bit, you know, maybe into the 80, 85 range, 85% range. So we we wouldn't, you know, to be conservative, we, we wouldn't want to be projecting, you know, high cash on cash returns in the first couple of years. But you can see how it ramps up over time, right? As we reach stabilization, as we renovate units and then uh, getting the higher 
uh, premium rents, uh, higher cash flow, it'll be reflected. It's, here you can see how it's reflected in the projections. And then uh, on the third line, you can see how there's also return of capital and also proceeds from the sale. So in the fund, we plan to um, buy three to five assets over the next year. And then uh, over the, 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 the next several years, we plan on executing on our business plan. And then once we get the uh, assets ready for sale, uh, we will then um, sell the asset and then return the capital plus the profits to our investors as, as it happens, right? So um, obviously that's probably not gonna ha happen all at one time, but as we sell off assets, we're gonna return capital and the profits to you. Uh, we're not interested in holding your money hostage. Um, there's a bunch of private equity funds out there that are that have a 10 year horizon. That's a long time. Um, you know, time is precious. We want to get um, investors back their money and profits as soon as possible, okay? Um, most likely, uh, we will have another fund open concurren concurrently as this one's exiting, okay? So then you can evaluate us based on um, how good of a job or not that we've done for you. And then when we give back your capital and the profits, then you can decide whether you want to reinvest that with us. Uh, keep in mind that um, you can always use the depreciation from the future deal uh, to offset the deal that you're offset the capital gains that you've incurred um, from the deal that you're exiting uh, uh, currently or or in the same taxable year. Okay. And so here's a just a kind of an outline of what the fund looks like um, in years one to three. Uh, the first year uh, we're really going to uh, just be uh, taking in investors' capital. We're going to go on buy good deals. And uh, uh, this is a close-ended fund. So the funding period is over one year. And we're going to try to buy three to five assets. We have a one really good one right now. It's a class B ins institutional grade, 256 units with, with, uh, with very, very little de uh, deferred maintenance. Um, it's a very attractive asset. It's uh, off of a busy street. It's already the nicest looking property on that, on, on that entire street. Um, and so... Um, um, uh, maybe we could talk about it later, uh, uh, what, what the value plan is for that asset. But we're going to be acquiring assets uh, in a period of one year, uh, whether we end up with two, three, five. Um, let, let's see what happens. You know, we're uh, we're very disciplined buyers. Uh, the last time we bought a deal was 10 months ago, and we have been waiting for carnage, and we're starting to be uh, more aggressive as the carnage comes, and we're able to buy assets at distressed prices. Um. After we purchase the um, the after we acquire the assets, uh, we will execute our business plan. So this is your very typical, you know, making improvements. You know, whether we're renovating units, um, improving on uh, landscaping, uh, fixing up the pool area, adding um, grill pits, you know, um, dog park, whatever. You know, there's there's a whole, you know, adding um, EV charging stations, solar, you know. Uh, internet packages that there's so much that you can do. It's, it's actually pretty fun. We really, we really enjoy that part of the business. Um, once that's all done, once the bulk of the renovation value business plan is accomplished, then we'll, we will fine tune um, the, 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 um, the property for, to get it ready for sale. Right. So we'll, we'll always paying attention to the market for the optimal exit. Um, so doing the fine tuning process, we'll try to optimize NOI, any little tweaks that we can make, uh, try to boost that NOI a little bit more, try to get occupancy optimal at the at optimal level so that we can get the highest price for the property, okay? All right, finally, um, why do we do this? You know, I mean, there's so many ways to make money. I mean, I could probably just throw my money in, on Bitcoin and probably uh, make a lot of money doing nothing, right? Well, you know, we believe that um, we can do well by doing good, right? So, Really love what we do. Um, really like taking dilapidated properties and, and making them bring that curb appeal back. It's just, you know, pride of ownership, you know, and and also just giving our residents um, a better place to live, right? There's a certain segment of, of America that will always be renters, right? As, as, as housing prices become unreachable for many of us, um, some of us are just going to be forever renters. And to the extent that you can provide them 
with a nicer home to go to to come home to. Um, I I think it's a uh, you know it's 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 good, right? We we could we could do our part by making an impact, and and that's actually why we uh we named our uh, fund the multifamily uh, impact fund because we believe in making a difference, and so this is uh, these are just some of the um the organizations that that we we support and uh, that we're very passionate about. Um, the latest one that that we we really I'm I'm so glad that we met these people, but it's called Operation Underground Railroad, and um. These guys are based out of Utah, and um, what they do is um, they have a team of operatives. These are former uh, DHS agents that um, basically rescue uh, 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 human traffic children, people, you know, in in jurisdictions that America, can, the United States, cannot be involved in. So this is something that is a tragedy. It, it's sickening, but I'm just glad that we can support this or support the people who are. Uh, trying to end this, okay. Um, testimonials, you know, we we love feedback, both good and bad. Um, as I said, you know, one of our core values is Kaizen. Uh, we're always looking for ways to improve. Um, we're very open to criticism, so you know, if there's something that we should be doing that we're not, we are we are definitely open. Um, let me just read you um, one testimonial for from our from one of our investors. Uh, here's from Stephen. Um, I've invested in seven of break of day capitals deals and have been very happy with the results. I can always rely on Gary and the team to respond quickly and provide me with all of the information I need. I have complete comp confidence that Gary and the break of day team will continue to provide me with the information, diligence, and returns that I have experienced. So this is certainly something that I can resonate with. Um, I've personally invested in six deals with Gary and the Break of Day uh, team before uh, joining the team uh, over a year ago. And so I have certainly seen the way that Gary operates, the communication, the expertise, and then, uh, you know, finally just delivering on results, you know, and, and that's why I, um, you know, for me, um, it's very easy to tell the story of Break of Day Capital because we live and eat our own cooking. Uh, finally, um, thank you for bearing with me uh, on, on that long uh, presentation. But this is me, uh, Joseph Fang. Um, this is my number on the screen. Uh, here's my email, joseph at breakofdaycapital.com. Um, I'm more than happy to uh, get on a call with you. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, I'm very passionate about investing in general. Uh, multifamily is just one of the, the many asset classes that I like. Um, so if you want to know more about our deal or about the company, or if you want to just have a, get a second opinion about your portfolio, you know, I'm more than happy to help. You know, I have over 30 years of experience uh, in investing. I know a lot about public markets. Uh, that, that is the world that I came from. Um, I also know a lot about real estate being uh, an active uh, operator, um, uh, owner myself. And also just, uh, I've also have a lot of experience investing in syndication. So I can certainly share with you, you know, the, all the good and the bad that comes with it. So however I can be of service, you know, please, um, uh, consider me a resource. So, um, Alexandra, um, I, I don't have any more to say at this point. Um, uh, I'm ready for questions and the tougher, the better. I really love tough questions. We definitely have some questions, so I'm glad you said that. Um, we also have a few poll questions. Joseph has some really great free resources that he wants to share with you, uh, of course, if you want the resource. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a few poll questions while we're doing the Q&A. Please put your questions in the Q&A box. I'll start with the ones that are in there already. Uh, the first poll question is just the questions to ask before investing checklist, which is really useful. So if you want to say yes to that, I'll keep it up for a couple minutes. Um, so uh, we got a few questions from Lucia. Uh, preference or a difference of assets of DST with no leverage versus with leverage. What's your opinion? Um, wow. Um, so DST, I, I wasn't aware that they do not use any leverage. Uh, my understanding is that DSTs, um, for the most part, do use, maybe they do use modest leverage. And the reason why is because, you know, you you are aware that uh, that there's something known as the seven seven deadly sins with, with DSTs. 
And so there's limitations on, you know, the ability to refinance, to be able to exit. Um, so DSTs generally have to buy uh, cash flowing assets with very little value add component to it. Um, and again, they, 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 it comes with very, uh, it comes with limitations um, that uh, you just have to be aware of. Now, again, um, DSTs are great for deferring taxes, right? It, it's, it's great to take that 1031 exchange money. The problem with DSTs is that the returns tend to be um, on the lower side, right? So the DSTs that I've seen in the past, you're probably looking at five to 6% cash on cash. Uh, and if you're lucky, maybe 10% IRR all in. And so you have to factor in, okay, great. I am deferring a lot of taxes from the deal that I'm exiting, but then I'm also going into a, a, an asset where the return profile is not as attractive as a standard syndication, okay? So you have to evaluate, okay, if I pay a little bit of tax, or there's actually other ways to defer tax, but is it worth it? for me to skip out on the ability to receive a 61% IRR, right? Like if you, if your returns are so significant by being in the, by investing with the right operators, by being in the right syndications, like, is that, would you be, you know, you have to ask yourself, are you better off, you know, potentially paying tax, but getting a much, much higher return, right? So don't let the tax tail wag the dog, okay, is what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah. and let me finish that, uh, that point by adding that, um, as I mentioned during my presentation, when you exit out of a deal, whether it's a uh, real estate that you own or a syndication that you own, um, but, but by reinvesting the proceeds in another syndication passively like ours, we will give you bonus depreciation in the 70% plus range. So therefore, that actually can mitigate, can actually offset the capital capital gains that you're triggering. Okay, so think about that. Um, that, that you know, you you'll be able to not only uh, be invested in something that has much higher potential uh, risk return profile, but you're still also able to def def defer most of those taxes. Okay. Uh, finally, um, I, as I mentioned before you can also potentially come in as a tick partner. So you can take the 1031 exchange money and be a partner alongside of an active or a, a, alongside a regular syndication. Again, you'll be able to defer taxes and, and have much higher, be, uh, be invested in something that has potentially much higher risk return profile than a DST. Yeah, so it seems to me that uh, DST is more about the tax deferment aspect than the return aspect, whereas syndication is more about the return. And then there's a little bit or a good amount, I would say, of tax deferment, but not the 100% tax deferment. But if the returns are good enough, then you know, maybe the tax deferment is something that you don't need 100% right now. Uh, you can maybe pay a little bit of taxes. So th that answers, I think, a few questions that uh, I saw Sue asked a similar question as well. Would you say that sums it up pretty well, Joseph? Sure. Okay, great. I'm going to launch the next poll question, which is an additional resource that Joseph wants to share with y'all, uh, the portfolio tracker to track how all your investments are performing from Performa to actual. So that's uh, an interesting resource. I, if you want to say yes to that, I'll leave it up for a little longer. Uh, Lucia also had a question about storage properties. I know you're in multifamily, but any opinions on storage? Thank you for that. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of chuckling because uh, I've been looking for a really good self self storage sponsor for a really long time, <laughs> um, for years, you know. And, and in fact, um, um, I have invested with one that uh, unfortunately I'm not very happy with. Um, they uh, over the last uh, five years they've uh, performing uh, uh, below expectations. Um, uh, something you, you just have to, you have to be very careful, you know, again, with the operator, there's certainly good self-storage operators out there. And um, the, the really good ones with a strong track record will be able to navigate uh, through uh, tough times. Okay. Um, something to think about with self-storage at a high level, 
is that um, because they're a little bit easier to get permits for, uh, there is likely a potential for uh, too much supply. Okay, so you really have to understand the market, that's that sub market, and making sure that the operator is fully aware um, that um, they have done the feasibility studies, you know, the, the the demographic studies. Make sure that these guys really understand the likelihood of another self storage unit being built. Okay, but they are cool, you know. They you don't have to deal with tenants, toilets, trash, and all that stuff. I like them. I like them a lot. Um, but the risk there is overbuilt, okay, and and just oversupply. Um, so um, uh, just something to be aware of. And um, I actually just spoke with a a, a very competent uh, self storage operator, and I want to add a comment that he made that I thought was really interesting. Um, he's saying that um, a lot of sort of the millennial uh, renters are opting for renting one bedroom units with a, like a self-storage unit, not, not together on the same site, but just instead of renting a two bedroom unit for like 1800 bucks, they're getting like a one bedroom unit for $1,200 and then spending a hundred bucks or 200 bucks on a self-storage offsite somewhere for all the, you know, all their gadgets, you know, their bikes and surfer, surfboards, et cetera. Um, and this is a way to kind of save a little bit of money. And I thought that was pretty cool. So, um, I definitely like them. Just make sure you invest with a good operator. And that's going to be the main theme of this presentation. I'm going to keep keep pounding that into your heads. Like, make sure you invest with a good operator, with a great track record, and, uh, you know, with, with an operational expertise in what they do. Yes. Uh, I like uh, Young Ping in the uh, chat said, uh, can you send me some more information? I think I want to work with Joseph, but I want to see track records before investing. That's smart, Young Ping. Uh, that's what you should be doing. And uh, I think that's really, like you said, the theme of the presentation. I'm going to launch one more poll question, which is the last and final resource Joseph is offering, which is a real estate made easy guide to learn more about investing. Uh, so that's Really great if you uh, need a refresher, if you're kind of a beginner, I think that would be very helpful. Um, also, Stephen uh, asking in the Q&A, how often does the lender require the sponsors to personally guarantee the loans? Yeah, good question. Um, generally speaking, um, these loans are non-recourse. So that means that they're really only capped at, you know, at the property level, right? But there are some instances we we've actually uh, on one deal that we have, we actually did have to personally sign. We did actually have to personally guarantee a certain amount of the loan. Uh, and the reason why was because we got such a favorable, we got such favorable terms for our investors. Like, I think we saved like a million dollars. Like, we're like, okay, we, we, we have to do it, you know? And, and, and so, you know, this is just something that we took on, but generally speaking, no, it's non-recourse, but there is something called a bad boy carve out, meaning that. If you violate certain co uh, covenants, like, you know, if there's fraud or if there's any kind of criminal activity, or if you do something shady, they, then they can't come after you personally. That makes sense. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, it's great that you were able to secure that deal uh, with interest rates the way they are as well. Creative financing is, I think, definitely something we all have to consider if the right deal is there. Um also, uh, Lucia asking, uh, communication with whom? So you mentioned communication is, is so important, but it seems like there are many layers. There's the manager, the broker dealer, the selling broker, who is the best person to communicate to get a straight answer? Yeah. So, um, I love this question. Um, I would encourage all of you to try to work directly with the operator. So what that, so just when, whenever you hear that word operator, it's the person, it's the team that is actually acquiring the deal. They're, they're the ones going out to brokers and finding deals. They're the ones that are operating the deals and they're the ones that are responsible for exiting the deals, okay? So people, these are the you know boots on the ground, the people that are in the trenches doing all the work. Broker dealers are people, they're, they're typically RIAs or um, firms that um, you know raise capital. They bring capital to the operators, to the sponsors. So they'll, you know, obviously they're gonna take a cut. They have a commission. And and I don't know if sometimes it's the op it, sometimes it's the sponsor team that pays for the commission. Sometimes it comes out of the investment. It comes out of the capital 
of um the investor, right? So I I I don't really understand. I, not that I don't understand I, that part. I'm not really sure. Uh, it's it's a deal by deal type of thing, but I encourage you to to do to go out there and look for people like us, the people who are actually in the trenches, okay, and then to deal with us directly. And with that, the person that you really should be speaking with are either the uh, direct or either the investor relations person, such as myself, right? I'm the, per you know, my, my key role with Break of Day Capital is to keep our investors educated and uh, uh, kept up to date on everything that's going on with the portfolio. Um, but I'm also networking. I'm also um, uh, building relationships with potential investors, kind of telling our story uh, you know, sharing with you, you know, our values, our perspectives, our investment strategy. And so at the very least, you know, you need, you need to have direct access to people like me. Um, sometimes, um, um, you know, and, and Gary, uh, you know, our company CEO, he's super, super busy, but he will make time to speak with you, you know, and that's, that's pretty cool, right? Like, can you imagine, like, can you imagine investing in 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 IBM and and like getting on the phone with the CEO who, of IBM? It's impossible, right? Like who who even knows who the CEO of IBM is, right? So like this is what you know. This is what I encourage you to do. You know, you work with kind of a boutique-ish shop, not too big, not too small. You know, uh, professionals who who are really focused and and. But there's not that many, you know, there aren't that many layers between us. Like, you'll deal with them directly. And that's what I encourage you to seek out. That's good advice. Um, Stephen also asking, why does Class C receive higher returns? Higher investments receive higher returns? Question mark. Yeah. So that's kind of his his uh, yeah. question there. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a long-winded answer for this one. Um, <laughs> generally speaking, okay, um, you know, because we do have to spend time with our investors. And when you invest $50,000, you know, uh, versus somebody who's going to invest a million or 10 million, right? It's uh, the person that invests, you know, a million or 10 million, um, you know, gets gets us to our finish line a lot quicker. And and we, we don't have to do as much paperwork. And, you know, we don't have to spend as much time. And and therefore, to reward that, that um, uh, the larger checks, right? We we um we offer a better split, um and this is very common. This is very typical in the industry. Um, um you know a lot of uh, a lot of operators like us, and particularly the the ones that have been around for 30, 40 years, um, they 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 graduate to institutional level, and where their you know where their minimums are like ten million dollars, right? And so, this is really just a way. Uh, to uh, to basically offer, you know, call it a discount, you know, for large checks. That makes sense. Um, Winnie was asking on filing tax returns, will it be a K-1 or a Schedule E? Yeah, good question. Um, so this will be a Schedule K-1. Uh, so these are passed through entities. And so all the the, the cash flow, the, the, the depreciation, whatever the passive income or, or the passive losses will show up on, the, on your K-1. Okay, great. Um, so I stopped sharing your screen because I wanted to just show this. I know it's not part of your presentation, but I did catch it on your website, these full cycle exits. So for those of you asking for some examples, I'm going to leave that up just so that you can take a look at that. Uh, let's see here. Um, Stephen asking, is, is, not the higher, is the higher return at the expense of the other class of investors? No, no. No, it's not. Okay. All right. Robin asking, uh, what if the fees collected over time don't match or exceed the sponsor's financial investment? Is it a write-off as a costly, poor financial investment? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, stuff like stuff like that does happen. And so, yeah, ultimately, um, if you end up losing money on a deal, then uh, the best case out of that is a, is a, it is a write-off. Okay. Tony asking, are you saying you keep properties after five to seven years? Great question. No, we do not believe in holding properties uh, for the for the very long haul. Here's why. Um, when you go through one of these upgrade cycles, uh, let's, let's say, I'll, I'll give you a real example. This deal that we're buying right now, 
this 35, $34.5 million purchase, we have a $2.4 million renovation budget, right? So we're going to, we're going to use up that money. We're going to make the, the property really nice. And, um, we're going to hold it until we reach stabilization. We're going to sell it and maximize our return. If we were to hang on to this property, let's say um, some other operator's uh, investment strategy is to refinance out the equity. Let's say um, we give back your capital, right? Let's say we do 100% refinance. You, it, that, that's a that's a non-taxable event, which is great. But you, and you still own the deal. So you continue to earn the cash flow. Fantastic. Now, in five to seven years, the property is now outdated again. So now we're going to have to spend another three to $5 million fixing things up again. And where's that money? Where, where do you think that money is going to come from, right? It's either going to come from the operations or it's going to come from you. And so therefore, um, we don't believe in holding properties really, really long-term. Uh, not for this kind of strategy. Now, if you are the type that likes to hold property forever and ever, then you should buy, you should buy class A, Luxury, or maybe not luxury, but let's just say class A, you should buy something that was built yesterday, right? With with no deferred maintenance and just hang on to it forever and ever. And, or at least um, wait for another, you know, wait 10, 20 years before it really needs to be upgraded, right? But the trade-off is you're going to get a lesser return. You know, you're probably um, looking yeah. at, you're probably looking at 10 to 12% IRR as opposed to 15 to 20. So yeah. there's a trade-off. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I think that answers Robin's question, which is, what is the reason you would exit a profitable income producing? So, you know, um, this is, I love this question because I get it all the time. And, mm -hmm. and that is the reason when you, when you own the property long enough, you know, that deferring the deferred maintenance, or I should say the, we call it a CapEx cycle. It, it, it comes back around again. And so you're going to need a few million to put back into the property. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, and, and I'm so glad you asked this question because no one ever talks about this. Like they don't tell you, oh yeah, you know, we hold on to the property forever. Um, therefore we don't trigger any tax consequences. Oh, but they don't tell you, oh, but then we're going to need three to five, you know, another three to $5 million in a few years <laughs> to, um, to, to fix up the properties again. Right. Yeah. So something else I want to mention is this, um, when you're executing on a value add strategy like ourselves, um, Think of um, think of the the value creation like a like a hockey stick. Okay, so you start off here, and then as you're renovating units and getting the rent bumps, you know, getting the three to four hundred million, three to four hundred dollar rent increases because you've now improved the unit significantly. That increase in value, uh, it, it 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 rises rapidly, right, until you get to stabilization, right, and then it kind of plateaus out, right. So that steep part of the curve is what we're trying to capture. That is the forced appreciation. That is the alpha generation. That is what you pay us to do, okay? The rest of it is all market driven. Once you get to stabilization, it plateaus out because now you, you, you can only increase uh, uh, rent rents like a few percent based on market. We, you're, not, you're no longer getting that three to $400 bump, you know, that 20, 30, 40% increase based on something you did. Right. So what we want to do is to continuously repeat that value creation process. We want to be in that steep part of the curve. And it's called the velocity of money, where you're basically growing at a much higher, much rapid, much more rapid rate and just continue to repeat that process. We are more concerned about tax on a secondary basis because we think that we can make more money. Um, despite having to pay a little bit of tax mm -hmm. than to do make less money and then worry too much about tax. Again, not letting the tax tail whack the dog. I like that. And I think you mentioned before, and I'll, I'll reiterate that there are other tax deferment strategies that don't involve a 1031 exchange or DST. We've had some speakers come in and talk about trusts in which you can put your money that have tax deferment um, capabilities and also asset protection uh, benefits as well. They aren't cheap to set up, but if you are planning to do this strategy, something like that makes a lot of sense. And then you could just make more money on these types of deals. So um, definitely don't think that you're just limited to one tax deferment strategy. And the bonus depreciation is great as well. Um, you know, we're putting out 
our magazine issue in a couple of weeks and a little uh, disclaimer or spoiler, I should say, it is going to be about taxes. And so I hope you all will read that because uh, it definitely has some really great strategies from a lot of different experts on all the options because there really isn't one way to do it or one way to invest. Um, but it's good to just know what is out there and what your options are. Um, so just a couple more questions. I know we're way over on time. So thank you for staying, Joseph. Um, of course, we are recording this. So if anyone needs to go, I, I understand. <laughs> uh, Z asking, do you see cap rates in multifamily properties going up in this high interest rate environment? Great question. Um, so they have been going up, right? Um, there is some coral, there is correlation between interest rates and cap rates, right? It's it's not a secret, but that's not the only thing. Um, cap rates is also a function of markets, right? Uh, Phoenix, where we're Phoenix and Tucson, where we are, is high, they're, they're highly unlikely going to be, uh, it, it's highly unlikely that the cap rates are going to go much higher versus like, let's say, um, I hate to pick on Kentucky, but let's say Paducah. I've been there. Uh, let's say Paducah, Kentucky, you know, it's going to be, they're going to be like at a seven, eight cap, right? And so which market is cheaper, right? Well, you might think it's Kentucky, but the problem is there's not a lot of employment there. There's not a lot of population in migration. Therefore, there's very little growth, but there's no growth potential in Paducah, Kentucky. And um. Cap rates is also a function of the desirability of a market, right? And so uh, some markets will experience more cap rate decompression because it's not that desirable. Some markets will not. Um, and so there are some operators are going out to the Midwest because cap rates are lower, or I should say cap rates are higher there than your Texas, you know, your, your Florida, your, your Arizona markets. Um, they're chasing after yield, right? But my, in my hum, humble opinion, the, the 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 issue there is you're going into a market that doesn't have a lot of growth. And so, what happens when things normalize? And well, you bought a seven cap, but you are going to be exiting at a, you know, the same cap rate or 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 higher, and you're not going to get the rent bumps that you wanted. So. This is a long winded, long winded way of saying that you really want to be in a high growth market uh, and have that that tailwind and have the sale at your back um, for for you to be able to see appreciation and cap rates are really just it's it's just a it's just a valuation for the for the it's just like it's just kind of like what cap rate are you going to buy Microsoft at right cap rate is just an inverse of the PE multiple right. So why do people pay such low cap rates for Microsoft or NVIDIA or, you know, Facebook, Google? It's because they have high growth potentials because they're involved with AI, right? And so you, as interest rates go up, you know, with the cap rates, with the PE ratio of Microsoft, NVIDIA go down? Maybe not because they have different fundamentals. And so... um. I don't think cap rates are going to come, they're going to go up. I don't think they're going to go much more, generally speaking. And it's going to be very different in different markets. And again, this is go, this goes back to why you need to invest with operators that know their market. Every market's different. You, you all know Absolutely. this. Mark, real estate is so hyper-localized. Like it's literally, you need to know it street by street. Okay. Um. I also wanted to, to answer this question from a macro level. Um, the team is very focused on, on asset management and operational expertise, but I spend most of my time thinking about macro conditions um, because the world, we have a managed economy and the world, I should say the United States economy is pretty much like whatever, whatever the Fed does, <laughs> we all feel it, like whether it's good or bad, whether it's, whether they're printing money or they're tightening, you know, it affects every. It affects asset prices, right? Well, I'm going to tell you this, and and this is not something I was prepared to to share with you on this call, um, but I encourage you to look at this. 
Uh, everybody is still afraid of interest rates going up. Well, I'm going to take the opposite uh, side of. I'm going to take the um, the other end of that 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 argument. I think rates are 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 going to be on their way down soon. And here's why: if you look at the amount of government debt, okay, you know all the money that was printed during COVID, all the money that was printed after COVID, even the money that was printed before that, right? That's not just money that was printed. There's on the other side of that balance sheet is a loan. This is money that the government owes, okay? And so what happens is when they come due, we already know they're not going to be able to pay it off. But when these government loans come due, these treasuries, you know, when they come due, they have to be re they have to be refinanced. And a lot of these loans were done when rates were at 2.5%, 3%. But if they're having if they're having to be refinanced in 2024, which a lot of them are, and if you can do them at five and a quarter, five five and a half percent, the government doesn't have enough money to, to make the interest payments, mm -hmm. right? So if you look at the interest payments of the U.S. government, and you look at the tax receipts, there's a net shortage. So somewhere between four to nine trillion dollars of shortfall. So you tell me, are we going to have to cut rates again? Or are we going to have to print more money? Mm. And the answer is, it's going to have to be both. Why? It's just math, guys. No matter what Jay Powell says, oh, we're going to go higher for longer. Well, if you just do the math, if you look at things, you know, if you don't focus on what people are saying on TV, focus on what's really happening behind the scenes and you'll realize that they don't have a choice. Mm. So when rates come back down, when they print money, guess what happens? Cap rates are going to recompress. Asset value is going to skyrocket again. I like that. I like I like your your take on it. Uh, really and, interesting. And just so you guys know, none of this is underwritten in our model. Okay, we are still underwriting to no growth, to a, a recessionary conditions. We we padded all of our reserves. We're keeping a lot of liquidity at the corporate level. Everything I just told you is internal research, internal comments that we don't really necessarily share with the public. Um, if if we're right, if I'm right, that all this stuff happens over the next couple of years, this is all additional tailwinds to our mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. and, but we have not projected that. That's great. I, and I think that serves as a lesson for everyone as an investor to always uh underestimate to conservatively project to make sure that you have that padding but also know that if things do go better than you expect that you're going to get a lot more return for that you're going to take that opportunity that you had that maybe others didn't take at that time and you're going to be in a better position right so i think that makes a lot of sense um and uh, tina saying thank you for sharing your thoughts on this q a hope it will be part of the recording also i need to digest it some more i totally agree tina that's why we are recording it we're going to send you the recording tomorrow and the slides you can even pick joseph's brain uh fortunately he is very generous with his time. I don't know how he does it, but uh, he will be connecting with all you who wants to talk uh, a little bit more uh, about really anything. So Tina says, thank you, Joseph. Um, uh, you know, on that note of just the economy in general, I'll finish up with the last questions from Young Ping. Um, he said, you don't invest in California. Is the prime time over for California? Will investing in real estate be more risky these days due to a potential crash? So um, I mean, you've obviously, you know, chosen the Southwest as your focus. Um, what are your thoughts on California? What do you think about a crash coming? Great question. Um, so, you know, having invested in Southern California over 20 years, and we still own property here, um, uh, it, it's a tough place. You know, it's a tough place to to be a landlord. Um, you know, it's not business friendly. It's not mm -hmm. landlord friendly. Um, you know, I've gone through, I've been dragged through an eviction uh, lawsuit before, and it's just, it's just not fun, right? Uh, yeah. it, it, it is what it is. Now, having said that, I have operator friends who specializes in California, and they're good at it. So again, do you guys see the theme here? Like, when you bet with the right operator, they know how to, they know how to uh, work their markets, you know, they, they, they're good at it, you know, and so I, uh, I have friends who, um who are good in this who are good in Southern California. Um, we like business friendly, 
uh, and landlord friendly states. And and we like um, uh, uh, Arizona for for all those reasons. You know, mm -hmm. business friendly, low uh, landlord friendly, low cost of living, no earthquakes, no tornadoes, no hurricanes. Um, the property taxes are capped at five percent. Nice. Um, and so you know we, we don't have to worry about frozen broken pipes. And there's a lot of growth, you know, um, and, and, you know, and then, you know, I, we also get asked a lot about the water situation. Yeah. You know, it is a concern. Uh, the top researchers are working on it. You know, this is a, this is actually a problem that affects the entire Southwest because we get all of our water from the Colorado river. So, you know, long-term there is a solution. Um, so, and that's, and that's why, that's why we invest in Arizona because we can get a little bit more bang for our buck little bit more cash flow, although Arizona is becoming more of an appreciation market as well. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, we, we don't have to deal with a lot of the issues that we have to deal with in, in California. As far as whether I see a crash coming, no, I do not. Uh, not yet. Uh, and here's why. Um, the Fed uh, artificially uh, boosted the economy by uh, taking rates to close to zero and printed three and a half trillion dollars, more like five. Um, when you do that, all asset prices, you know, go up, whatever it is, you know, you know, anything that's not paper is going up in value, or I should say going up in price. Um, and there's three to $5 trillion of dry powder of institutional dry powder waiting for all this, this, this distress to come. Um, so what I can tell you is that having invested in for, for over 30 years, usually when there's a crash, um, it's usually uh, preceded by major euphoria where everybody's where everybody's all in, full leverage, nothing left. You you've used up all your money and you're max leveraged out, right? We don't have those conditions today. You know, the loans for the most part are pretty high quality. Um, there's a lot of dry powder, there's a lot of equity. Um, and the Fed has taken back a lot of the artificial uh inflating they've done, you know, in 21. They've taken a lot of that back. And, you know, obviously it feels very uncomfortable today. And so you just don't have the conditions for a market crash yet. So until you see something like 2006 again, where banks are way over levered, uh, where when you have realtors buying 30 properties, having, you know, 30, 30 mortgages, until you see euphoria, until you see excessive uh, irresponsible behavior, we're not going to have a crash. That, that's, not how it, not, that's not how they start. Hmm. Well, I will leave us with that positive note. Uh, I think that it's good for us to uh, look at this as, like you said, uh, many decades maybe of investing, right? We're in a very small frame of time when it comes to the cycle and where we're at. Uh, there are still really great opportunities out there with the right sponsors that have the right experience in those markets, regardless of what's happening in the economy, adding value. I mean, there's just so many different things that you talked about today that I think are so relevant to where we are in our economy. And I hope that all of you on the call uh, feel like you learned something, uh, whether you're looking to do a passive investment or not. I just think this is great information, Joseph. I really appreciate your time as always. And, you know, I know Gary couldn't join. I also really enjoy talking to Gary. Um, maybe next time you all can both be on and educate our members again on maybe an update of what you all are doing. Uh, so I do appreciate everyone being on the call. We will send you the recording and the slides and Joseph's information. If you requested any free resources, Joseph uh, will be sending those out to you. So everyone, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.